So the last thing I watched before going to sleep last night was a two-hour um, video interview with the founder of mormonstories.org, John DeLynn, and the founder of Mormon Expression Podcast, John Larson. And I've been following Mormon Stories for uh, a couple months now. Um, and I've been struck by, really been touched and moved by um, learning about the journey of um, a whole community of Mormons across the globe who have walked to the edge of their faith that they were taught and um, have chosen to question what they've been taught and in a sense take back their power to choose what they believe in and how they relate with their own sense of faith and what they value um, in their communities. And given the rigidity and insular nature of that world, it's just, it's incredible to hear the stories. And last night, what I really touched for the first time was um, some truth in me about the emotional truth. Uh, and I mentioned that I had been inspired to do life coach training with Martha Beck because I had read her memoir about leaving the Mormon church her own journey of that and I I was just fascinated with the uh, with the isolation and the fear that's involved in leaving a world that is sheltered and contained by its belief system and that keeps people in it out of fear of the consequences of violating that belief system. And so to leave and escape and to come out intact um, to me was a story that inspired me because I felt and I sensed my own entrapment in my own set of belief systems at that time that I was just waking up to and it was it was a weight that I was just accustomed to carrying around my whole life accustomed to sort of maneuvering within but no one had ever revealed to me the possibility of completely shattering those beliefs and finding my own way um, without becoming homeless, impoverished, and uh, completely without a community or relationship. So those were always the threats to my own welfare if I considered stepping outside the boundaries. And what I'll say is, just to say it out loud, uh, is if, you know, when people ask, People ask why I didn't practice medicine. And the real question to me is not why I didn't practice medicine, but why did I go to medical school in the first place? And the true answer is because I was too weak to do anything else at the time. I was too afraid to do anything more um, courageous and uniquely mine at the time. That's my honest answer. That's not, I'm not saying anything about anyone else. I'm saying that's my truth. And that's why I have that little moment of crinkling inside when people kind of ask me about that. And yet I still use it in a way as a calling card, as something I've done. So I still haven't been able to completely um, exit that, that societal um, convention that makes it significant that I did those, you know, four years of school, of experience. So I play along 
and <clears throat> and it's true that I did experience that but it would be like saying for somebody who left the Mormon church to continue to refer to themselves as, as an ex-Mormon for the rest of their lives <clears throat> to me it's the same and that's a choice and it's fine but it's just something to notice and I, I mean I, I wanted to say that my, my primary emotion after watching the interview last night because it was really so eloquently expressed by John Larson was, you know, when he started the podcast and started to talk to people um, and to hear, to see, to see the listeners, the subscriber rate <clears throat> grow and to hear the feedback that he was hearing, he began to sense the enormity of the pain that he was sitting on with this storyline and this whole aspect of the journey. And it made him angry to know that there were so many people in so much pain around this because of a system where there's no one person to blame, but it's the entire system in which they were all brought up <clears throat> and a product of. And what do you call it? Um, it's a religion, it's a culture, it's a way of life, it's a belief system, it's a lifestyle. And it's, the parallels are, you know, the, this, this whole cauldron of success and achievement and status and power and wealth that we're living in right now in America um, that we can say that we're all a product of. And I'm just going to drill down further to look at the, at the overlap between the Chinese kind of Confucian mindset or whatever, wherever this idea came from, that there's like one school where everyone goes who's the best and then the rest you can just throw in the towel and forget about it. That distorted idea where there's one field that you can study, whether it's doctor or I guess there's, you know, there's a population now that believes it's engineer that's the best. And you have to find out what the number one school in engineering is and go there. Otherwise, just forget about it. So these distorted ways of thinking are the air in which we breathe. And I'll just say that from growing up in that kind of environment. It was, it was when I was three years old, I remember hearing about Harvard. And I also remember thinking, I'm going to go there someday. And we don't even know where this comes from because, it's, again, it's just the air we breathe. And we don't have a chance to question it when we're three years old. Maybe if we're lucky in our lifetime, we have a chance to question it. But my emotion about this is, where's the outrage? You know, I'm reading all of the writing about Palo Alto and the tragedies. And there's a lot of emotional kind of the grief and the compassion and the kindness and policy making and wanting to make things nicer for the students in terms of stress and sleep. Where's the outrage? And I'm talking about, you know, there was one writing by a student that touched on the outrage. But I am outraged that there's this pile of pain that I sense, and I know that that's part of my resistance in actually pouring myself into going out there and finding the stories of navigating that pain. Because I don't know, you know, if I have the support system to actually bring me through that experience, to hear that what I've experienced is one tiny little chip on a huge iceberg that is global and that is the silencing of stories and the silencing of individuals and their ability to choose and their ability to claim their power and their ability to find their own worth in this world that's not tied to conditionality, some belief system. So I, I feel outrage. It's very difficult for me to express outrage. And I notice how that's another aspect of why I kind of 
have these little corners of my world where I put my truth and I sort of like veil it in something that's that I think is more palatable for public digestion because basically since I haven't found my community of pain <laughs> um, and healing and growth around this issue I've had to construct this facade of being healed in a certain way, being at peace in a certain way, and looking like I am a certain way to be acceptable. Whereas there's a lot of my emotions that are on that edge of can can it be can it be taken? Can you take it? Or does it begin to become alienating? And I'm very aware of how big emotions alienate people. And, uh, and yet, there's no healing without actually feeling the magnitude of those emotions in a way that allows them, them to really move through and be experienced and be cleansed through the through the full experience of them and um, you know that was also discussed on this interview where it's like there's a there's a period of time <clears throat> where that kind of catharsis is helpful and then you move on you move through it so what I observe is uh, you know, being inspired by Martha Beck to, by a memoir she wrote 10 years earlier, then going into her life coach training program, which represented something in her own life journey that was moving beyond it, um, I did not give myself the chance to fully feel my outrage. And in that, trying to jump into love and forgiveness having not felt the outrage leaves this hole where there's no fuel for finding my own voice because I haven't felt safe in my own outrage and um I'm outraged at the wasted lives and the wasted talent and the wasted uh, souls that um, are a result of being locked into a belief system that no one has questioned. So I see it very much as like the Mormon church that kind of churns people out and gives them a life that is fine as long as they don't look outside or they don't question the consistencies of all the stories they've been told or they don't look at other possibilities for how to live their life as long as you don't do any of that your life is great you've got community you've got you know place for your children to be for a place to grow old a place to go through rituals you know a safety net um a philosophy, a lot of reading material, you know. And so let me just draw the parallels of, you know, as long as you play the game of the Chinese family, you marry the right person, you get the you get the right job, you have the right gender kid, you and then those kids go to the right college, get the right profession, marry the right person, have the right kid. As long as that continues in perpetuity, your life is fine. You will always be invited to dim sum. You will always, um, you know, get red envelopes on holidays. You're always uh, going to have your place in the ancestral shrine. And it's pretty cut and dry. It's like a it's like a path that's been well worn for thousands of years. 
But the minute you question it and look at other possibilities for how life might be, you face isolation, financial unplugging, um, loss of your sense of any kind of community, um, and identity. And that's the, that's the other parallel, you know, that something as deep as Mormonism, even though it appears to the outside to be a religion, it's actually an identity. And same with Chinese culture, there's the DNA aspect, and then there's the kind of the cultural identity that that is always part of navigating uh, in this country when you're talking about having that culture and being in a different culture on the outside. So in different parts of the country, Chinese people have been able to isolate more or less. So I grew up in the Midwest where we didn't have other, basically, a lot of other Chinese people around. Um, in school, there were none until junior high. And so we were all very used to kind of assimilating. And I guess here's my, here's the thing. The only dialogues that are happening up in the Asian America, kind of publicly in the media about Asian America are about racism and social justice. So that's one, one angle. And about stereotypes. And so there's just a lot of, uh, and then there's kind of the, the race to get in popular culture to kind of get in more movies and to get on TV as sitcoms and so there's that there's no discussion of the real pain the real journey the real navigating that each of us is doing to kind of walk this line of who am I what am I here to do what it, you know, what is the meaning of life, really? What is the meaning of my life? Not life in general, but my life. So how do we, how have we navigated that? And that's, that's not a conversation that I'm seeing specific to being Asian. And I'm going to just say Chinese because Asian is such a meaningless term because it involves so many different cultures and their own belief systems. So I'd rather focus on what I know from experience, which is Chinese slash somewhat Taiwanese, but you know, to let the, the Vietnamese people have their conversation, to let the Cambodian people have their conversation, let the Korean and the Japanese have their conversation. Because there's, there's many subtleties. And specific, there's things that will be shared and there's things that will be um, distinct. And so they each deserve their own conversation. And I think there's another whole conversation about being gay and Asian, which definitely isn't being talked about. Maybe in Hollywood, a few interviews here and there, George Takai, but I mean... Let's let's get it out of the celebrity realm and let's talk to real people who are just navigating the line between setting up a nice white suburban affluent lifestyle, which is pretty easy to do if you've gone to the right school. You can set that life up relatively easily and just live a very nice quiet life and ignore the pain. Or you can actually turn toward it and acknowledge this pile of pain. And that's really the symbolism I see in Palo Alto, which is like the attempt to live the white affluent lifestyle in the suburbs. 
and pave over this huge mountain of pain and just try to get by and our kids are not going to let us do it our truth tellers are there to remind us that it's not going to work ignoring this pile of pain will not work at the end of the day we can pass it on to another generation to deal with or we can lean in and start rolling up our sleeves and digging in now so that's really what's come into focus for me which is as much as my entire wiring would like me to just turn away and find a way to just shut up and live a nice white suburban lifestyle and be part of that community and show up and just be a nice person there I cannot my soul cannot ignore this pile of pain because I was there that was me and somehow I'm here right now and it's not okay for me to just see that happening and not feel that it's ridiculous that it's ridiculous these belief systems and um, it's a trap that so many of us are in and we just feel lucky that we got out alive and, and then what are we going to do with that? What are we going to do with that feeling of being lucky to be alive? Are we just going to protect our own little little tribe, our, our family unit, and um, have that be enough? Or are we going to lift others up? Uh, that, that's the question and I know my I know my answer and even though I can know it I have to dig into my own feelings to find the fuel to really step into it and take action and gather others <clears throat> and using all my talents and finding the words finding the ways to open up and let my story be heard and judged and criticized and be offensive to some and knowing that my exact journey and the words that I had to say are exactly what someone out there needs to hear. I experienced it in this brief moment at UCSF this weekend. I was speaking to a bunch of students there in schools of nursing, pharmacy, physical therapy. Maybe there were some medical students there, probably not many. But I, bas I came out and said that I went to medical school out of family expectation, and there was all this chatter in the room. Um, and there, was, there were quite a few Asian American students there. And I know it's like, ev especially in a place like that, you know, where, um, frankly, probably a lot of the pharmacy students were ones that couldn't get into medical school or didn't, you know, choose to do that. But no one wants to say that. No one wants to say that out loud. They just want to, like, whoa, you know, phew, I, I got into medical school. Now my life is okay. Let me just put that behind me and not acknowledge that I might not have even chosen that in the first place. I was just running after yet another box on the list of what makes me worthy. But I don't even know that I haven't even verified that with my own truth. And you go through life like that. And you build a nice doctor lifestyle in the suburbs. And, you know, you, can, you just you ignore the pain over there. And then maybe one day you start feeling your own pain. 
lucky you, you get to wake up. But, you know, it, uh, this is happening in so many different ways in our society right now, where people are just being forced to confront the fact that they have not even touched meaning and purpose, and they have fame and, quote, success and recognition in this external world, and they haven't touched their capacity to feel or to love. When I say feel, feel pain, feel anger, feel outrage, feel grief, and to love that and to be with that. Not to stay protected in the armor of the appearance of success. And yeah, that's what I choose. To go and lift others up. To find the pile of pain. To speak directly to it. And to find the people whose stories need to be heard.